So, um, really lovely to see everybody here this evening. Um, I'd really like to welcome you to this special event on modern slavery hidden in plain sight, kindly hosted by The Conduit here, who are brilliantly in partnership with uh, Justice and Care, the award-winning charity, um, which uh, is at the forefront of some of the best work in supporting survivors of modern slavery and in terms of campaigning for justice and improvements to legislation and beyond. Uh, so it's a wonderful collaboration all in this room. Um, my name is Julie Etchingham. Um, I'm an anchor for ITV News. Uh, I'm usually on News at 10, but I've got the night off tonight to be here. So it's really, really wonderful. Um, and a huge thank you to The Conduit for hosting us all here this evening. I mean, we're really hoping what emerges from our conversation tonight is a renewed push to work against this appalling crime wherever and however we can by pulling on all the levers that we have in the room here tonight from all of your backgrounds and your specialisms and your expertise. I know that you're here from a host of different backgrounds and professions, so we're all really hoping that we can draw on that. Um, many of you will be aware of the challenge of modern slavery. Here's just a snapshot of what we're up against. It's a multi-billion pound global business, the fastest growing crime on the planet. It's estimated that 50 million men, women and children are ensnared globally. Every aspect of humanity can be exploited by criminals. Um, in the course of my work on this subject, I've witnessed it, whether it is uh, women trafficked uh, into sex work here in the UK, whether it's organ harvesting, whether it's women trapped in nail bars, men forced to work uh, in agriculture, Whatever you can exploit from a human being, uh, traffickers and enslavers will find a way of doing it. Uh, in the UK alone, it's estimated there are could be 100,000 victims hidden in plain sight, car washes, nail bars, restaurants. Some are ensnared in the vile practice of cuckooing, where drugs gangs take over a vulnerable person's home. Uh, and I've recently done some work with Justice and Care on that subject. And, of course, in tough economic times and in a world in upheaval from war and climate change, many more are becoming vulnerable. Uh, progress has been made. It can be made with endless renewed efforts uh, like the one we're trying to uh, spur on tonight. The UK had groundbreaking and world-leading legislation introduced in 2015 uh, under Theresa May's Modern Slavery Act. How do we renew momentum around that legislation. Um, there are big questions, of course, about the legislation that is uh, before Parliament at the moment over uh, illegal uh, migration. We've got a fantastic panel to illuminate and discuss this subject, um, to talk about how far we've come on modern slavery, what considerable challenges lie ahead. Um, a couple of people who are due to be on the panel are sadly missing. Caroline, uh, Caroline Hockey uh, KC uh, unfortunately had to be pulled away due to family reasons. And Julie Curry, uh, who works with Justice and Care, has been giving evidence in court. She had to be called into court. Um, uh, in that was planned. She hasn't done anything <laughs> wrong. <so. Yeah. laughs> in a modern slavery case. So uh, we, d we just hope all well, has gone well with her. Um, so to speak from the NGO third sector perspective on this panel, uh, Christian Guy, who's in the middle, he's the outgoing CEO of Justice and Care. His background is in Westminster, including working in number 10. Uh, he was also CEO of the Centre for Social Justice. He oversaw a study into human trafficking, which led to that groundbreaking Modern Slavery Act. Uh, from a business perspective, on the far end, we have Matt Crossman from the investment and wealth management company Rathbones. He's stewardship, stewardship director. Um, it's, he uses uh, the company's influence to help ensure companies consider human rights issues. He's engaging with investors too, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, everything from supply chains to pressure on big companies is part of what Rathbone part of what Rathbones prioritises. And to talk to us about victims and survivors and how best to support them alongside me is Debbie, who's been parachuted in brilliantly. Uh, she's the European Programme Manager at Justice and Care. She oversees the team of uh, 13 victim navigators across the UK and Romania. And before that, she had 30 years of working in the police and was one of the first victim navigators. And you will tell us all about what that actually entails very shortly. Um, 
one of the reasons I'm here this evening uh, is not just to get this conversation going, but also to give some insight into how the media works in the field of modern slavery in terms of trying to raise the profile of this issue. Um, and I think, just speaking personally, uh, the main driver for me was quite simply that once you have met a survivor of modern slavery and human trafficking, their story simply never leaves you. You can't pretend that you don't know about it and you can't pretend you haven't heard their story. Um, and it's about 20 years ago now that I was uh, invited to meet a victim of human trafficking and modern slavery. I'd never heard of it before. Um, it was a young Nigerian woman who was being held uh, on immigration offences in prison. She had been tricked into travelling to the UK on the promise of hotel work uh, by her traffickers. She was brought here, forced to work in a brothel, had her passport taken away, um, was subject to rape, abuse. She contracted HIV, for which she could barely get access to medication. Um, as I sat with her in the prison, she was showing me the scars on her arms from the belt uh, which her trafficker regularly used to beat her with. Um, and that story uh, has never left me. Um, and since then, I've tried to understand the story, to try to explain the story to others through, through my work in the media. I've met very many survivors who are all incredibly brave in sharing their story. Um, I met a young woman who'd been trafficked from the age of five to the age of 33, from Vietnam into China as a drugs mule. As soon as she reached puberty, she was put into sex work. She was trafficked out of China into Russia, into agricultural work. She was trafficked out of Russia into France for more sex work. Eventually, she was trafficked into the UK, <coughs> hidden on the back of a refrigerated lorry with her son on a different lorry, and the traffickers kept them apart. And she was eventually rescued when she presented at an NHS hospital uh, with breast cancer. And it was when an NGO picked her up and a doctor spotted the signs of slavery that she was rescued. Um, I could tell you very many more stories, and I know my uh, lovely colleagues on the panel will have uh, stories that have connected with them too. Um, but they sort of stay with you, and you remember every time you start to talk about the subject, they feel very close to you, all the people that you've worked with. So that's what's drawn me in. It's a hard story to get on air. You have to persuade editors who think it's just an immigration story, and they, you need to unpack it every time. But uh, with the help of other partners, uh, especially the sort of partners we've got all here this evening, we do manage to get it uh, to air. So um, I'd really like to, I think I might just turn to Debbie first, really, um, and to mention, too, that there'll be time for some questions. There's always a million things to say. Um, but we'll have some time for questions once we've got the conversation going um, and unpack the subject a bit um, there's a lot of questions about where the UK is at on this issue at the moment. So, Debbie, <clears throat> that's enough, more than enough for me. You work so close, closely with survivors of this appalling crime. Just give us a, a sort of hot take on where we're at with it, the sort of people that you uh, support, and what a victim navigator is. That looks good. Put it up. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Lovely. I got you, um, Debbie. Off you brilliant. go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think I need to start by saying that I am incredibly privileged to manage the team that I manage. I manage a team of exceptional individuals who are co located within police forces to support victims. And I think when I think about the job that they do, and I look back to my policing uh, time, that's what's really missing. It's that um, contact, that support, and the time. Police officers don't have the time that it takes to be able to do this. It's not because they're not willing. It's not because they don't want to. It's about time and resources and capacity. And the Victim Navigator Programme sees people victim navigators embedded within teams, not only providing that strategic advice maybe around the cultural aspects that they need to look at for victims, 
but to be able to be that friendly face when the police first go through the door. And I'm quite sure that nobody in this room has ever been on the other side of a door where police officers could come through all in their, all in their jumpsuits, all being very scary and shouting and, and all the rest of it. It is super scary when you're sat on the inside and you know that you've got to make some money. You know that they're, they're, your safety for that day depends upon you probably not engaging with those officers, that pretending that everything is okay when, when it isn't, and you are terrified of your situation anyway, let alone what is coming through the door. So the navigator goes with those police officers, goes in there. So certainly when I was working as a navigator, my hair's been pink now for four years. <laughs> it's quite clear that I'm not a police officer. But that's really, really helpful because then they've got that friendly face. And when you're, when you're there saying, I work with these men and women, these officers, but I am here for you. This is about you and what do you need and how can I help you? And that's really powerful. And it's really important to take time and to listen and to have that time. And when... One of the things that I always think about is um, I remember going on, on warrants out to, uh, out to brothels, for example, where the police would come charging through the door and the girls are all there scantily clad. And the police officers just stood there, like, boys, come on, let's turn around, give the girls some dignity, let them get dressed. And if they've got dressed, they then might talk to you. And it's, sometimes it is just reminding people to give people their dignity and make space for them as human beings. And that's what the navigator does initially. And it's reminding the police that potentially a Vietnamese person that you've taken out of a cannabis grow doesn't want pizza because it's 11 o'clock at night and that's the only shop that's open. Let's think about this before we go in and do that. Let's have the right food or the right things that we can provide people so that they feel comfortable. Um, and that's really, certainly our experience is that that's really important to to give people that space so just to be clear you work alongside the police don't you with your amazing police knowledge from your many years in in the force you are there alongside but your eyes are you're trying to see it through the victim's eyes and one of the reasons that's so important is that 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 trust in those first few seconds when somebody is rescued is crucial isn't it, it? A absolutely because if you empower somebody to feel like a human being again, that trust is built, and that, then that trust is ongoing, and the navigators then will walk that journey, and whatever that journey looks like for that individual with them, advocating on their behalf, making sure that their needs are met, whether that be through the criminal justice journey, whether it be an asylum um, journey, whether it be a repatriation. And a couple of the navigators that I manage are based out in Romania, so we look at that safe repatriation, making sure that um, the right checks are done out in Romania so that they're not going back to a hostile environment and they're all cared for. Thank you for that. That just gives us a really good insight into the frontline work that Christian is going on the whole time, in every town, in every city in this country. Just your sense of having navigated justice and care over these uh, years that you've been involved with it. I mean. You know, you can't overstate how pressing an issue this is. And it is everywhere. It is. And one of the ways, first of all, Julian, let me just say um, thank you for having us here tonight and leading this and for all you do to use your platform. Because running a charity like this, you're desperate for allies and ambassadors <laughs> and people who will create moments of attention. And you go into the living rooms of millions of people every day, apart from tonight, thank you, <laughs> um, and it makes an enormous difference. So I, we must hear about more from you, I think, about how you've used your platform, but it's phenomenal. Um, around the country, we've been, we've been amazed at where we've found, found this. We've got a navigator in, in Surrey in some of the sleepiest, most stunning Surrey villages. The police uh, are through the door, have concerns, through to the inner cities, of course, and every corner of the United Kingdom. That's one of the ways I think we've really made progress in the last 10 years, though, is that this is coming slowly out of the darkness, and people are now, thanks to people like you and others, more aware that this exists. We think there are more than 100,000 victims of slavery at any one time in, in the UK, more than the number of people sat in our prison system, if you want to compare it to a big sort of public policy issue. 
So it's everywhere, um, and as Debbie says, it can be utterly brutal, but um, the fight back is on. Yeah, and, and you've pushed on legislation, you've pioneered on practical work, like the work that Debbie's involved with. It's, you know, just, just articulate for us why you need this multi-pronged approach. It's because that it is that multi-layered aspect of this crime, isn't it? It is. It's, some issues, you could argue that if you just had a charity big enough, you might actually solve a problem. With human trafficking and modern slavery, it just isn't the case. There is no charity you can run that will be able to do everything that's needed or be big enough to hit the scale. This is not about growing big charities, building egos, getting brands, raising more money. This is about targeting um, the work that we can do as a charity, and there's a special role charities can play, which I can touch on if you like, but also getting other people to lead. Because you've, that can be down to us as consumers. It can be the police officer who walks through the door. It can be the prosecutor, be the judge. It can be the factory owner. Everyone has to play a part if this is going to be tackled and beaten. Um, it is not simply that we need an organization like ours to do the job. And so this has never been about building some mega charity to solve the problem and stroll in as a hero and make the difference. We play a part, but it's just one part. Yeah, And one crucial part is business engagement. Um, Matt, I'm just so interested in the priority that Rathbones is giving this. But I think like all of us, it's having just that sort of, per there's something that gets you about this issue. It's if you've got a sort of personal memory of a story that leaps out, it makes a difference. And we were just chatting beforehand and it would be really nice to hear a bit more of that and then tell us what Rathbones is doing. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, the memory for me, um, as you can tell from my dulcet tones, I come from the, the north of England. Um, and I had a family holiday in um, Morecambe. Just, and I remember sitting at sunset with my auntie Lynn, uh, looking at the sunset over Morecambe Bay as a, as a child. And uh, about three years into my career, uh, emerging career in ethical and sustainable investment with Rathbones back in sort of 2005, six, when I started working on um, UK supermarkets and, and researching their ESG credentials. And then obviously a few years later, we had the, the big story about the Morecambe Bay cockle picker disaster and just immediately made that connection between my sort of childhood memory and the, I can't remember, is it 28 people who lost their lives? Might it probably be more. Um, under a gangmasters kind of situation, incredibly vulnerable migrant labour and UK agricultural supply chains. So working with an NGO there, we did our first report, which was about you know, vulnerable migrant labour in the UK. And one of the things that's really interesting about this area, I work on a lot of different ESG issues, we call them environmental, social and governance issues. And you get a lot of debate and argument about you know, how far should business care about all these things. What I find about modern slavery is... It's the perfect overlap between the moral imperative to do something that we all feel as citizens and the financial imperative to sort out a risk to our economic lives. Um, and I hope that's okay to hold those two things in tension. But the numbers you mentioned, the ILO estimations are only estimations, 150 billion US dollars a year of an illegal trade. If I think about that as a whole of market, whole of world investor, that's an opportunity cost to all of those emerging markets that my pension fund's in, your pension fund's in. Uh, you think even in the UK here, the, the sort of back of an envelope figures, if we've got 100,000 victims that cost around £350,000 to the Home Office, if they touch that system every year, that's £35 billion. Could we be doing stuff better than that if we tackled this problem? So it's that perfect overlap of the moral case and the financial case that has really uh, triggered. And, you know, if you go back to family history of Rathbones, we've got um, William Rathbone IV, who was based in Liverpool, and he helped co-found the Society uh, for the Abolition of the Slave Trade in Liverpool in the 1790s, which is about equivalent to founding Extinction Rebellion, I think, kind of these <laughs> days. Um, so, yeah, we draw a bit on that family history and, and try and bring that into the, the current fight against modern slavery because we just see it as something that you should care about, even if you don't. Are companies engaging on this? I mean, there is an obligation under the Modern Slavery Act if you have a certain level of profits, if you're, you're of a certain size, you have to have your modern slavery statement on your website, don't you? But it's, there's a lot of questions about how much further this really needs to go to get proper engagement. Just talk to us a bit about that. Yeah, sure. So we, as Rathbones, that was how we sort of cut our teeth on this issue, really, was partnering with the Centre for Social Justice and a lot of those amazing 
flagship NGOs that help push that work, um, we saw the way in which this transparency regime, asking companies to report, changed the game in terms of our engagement with some of the tech companies over in California. So, so that's this is about first. supply, sorry to interrupt, this is transparency about supply, supply, supply chains. Chain. So, so who's providing your raw materials for the, the chips in your phone and, and, and so forth? Yeah, who cleans your offices, yeah. everything, for yeah. the whole gamut of your, your offering. Um, so for us, you know, we... You saw some companies like, you know, the MSs of this world will voluntarily do it as sort of a good, strong values. But how do you get everybody else along? Because if you don't get everybody else along, you're not tackling this everywhere, everything everywhere, all at once kind of problem that we have. So, yeah, the Modern Slavery Act, Section 54, every company over 36 million turnover in the UK has to produce this statement. Um, there's, there's two things I want to mention in terms of how investors have tried to push that engagement forward. So we've got a project called Votes Against Slavery, which is where if you don't report, as you should, uh, me and my team will analyse your statement and we'll let our global network of 132 other investors with $8.9 trillion, asset, and trillion dollars in assets under management know and we'll vote against your report and accounts. But that's a bit like the start of the race, making sure that all these companies are at the start line. But it's not just about reporting, is it? It's about the real-world impact and the real-world behaviour change. We've got another project called Find It, Fix It, Prevent It, which kind of does what, exactly what it says on the tin, really, <laughs> encouraging companies to go from starting the race to running the race, really trying to tackle those things. But in answer to your question, it's an ongoing journey in terms of encouraging people to keep looking at this issue because it's only getting worse, as you mentioned at the start. They're world-leading Rathbodes. I mean, I, <laughs> in, a, in a field of plenty of people who talk about this and might see the supply chain's requirement in the law as a tick box these guys are the real deal and they're making a huge difference yeah i mean it is it's it's just, that's, that's why i love conversations like this you suddenly realize that there's really concrete work that can be going on whichever almost whichever angle you're coming at this from and and all the time people like debbie are absolutely at the sharp end trying to support those that have fallen prey to an appalling activity in a supply chain or simply just a criminal gang that know that they can make money by pushing a, a human being out into the worst circumstances possible. I think absolutely, and it takes more than just a navigator or a decent investigator or a lawyer. This is, this is everybody has a responsibility um, from, you know, a member of the public being selective about where they buy their clothes or um, where they have their nails done or where they have their car washed to the police doing the right thing and, and everybody else along that journey. It's, it's not just one person that is ever going to solve this problem. It's a joint thing for all of us. But one of the things that does cut through is when you get a conviction, when there is a successful prosecution, and obviously your work is vital to that because you're there to keep, keep a survivor engaged with the process when they know that they've got a trafficker watching their every move, potentially. I mean, I, I know of one safe house for survivors of, of, uh, of modern slavery where they have cameras on the doors. This is just here in London, and I've seen it in Nigeria as well, mm. where they... I mean, in Nigeria, they have armed guards outside uh, safe houses for women who've been trafficked because they know that, actually, if they're just really smart, they can get these people back get them out of the legal system and out of sight, and you've got that breathing down your neck. Yeah, and that, but that's where the trust and the relationship between the victim and the, and the navigator comes into play. And when you have that, you have that connection that somebody feels safe. Mm. I mean, I've, this morning, just there's an example of um, a gentleman that we've repatriated back to Romania. He's been working with um, my navigators out there found himself a job which is no mean feat out, out in Romania. But because of the support that he's had from the navigators, he's remained engaged with the navigator. And when that relationship with his employer has gone wrong last night, the person he called was the navigator who's got a hold of the local police and they've gone out there this morning and he's been rescued again this morning. And that's about that relationship and trust that people build up because of the work that we're putting in. But that's a team effort mm. that have got to that point, and that chap is now back with his family again this evening, which is, which is amazing. <laughs> and and not, what, not anything that we could do, or, you know, just as one person. It is that team, team effort. And in the UK, for me, that is about then us sort of looking um, at, at those supply chains and looking at, you know, what, what else can we do? What, how can we make this better? And 
part of my job is looking around what's that exciting thing what is it that we can do next that what can we challenge so that people aren't in that position yeah. again and looking at other cultures and societies and sort of the different things that um, other other countries are doing in this field and what can we bring to the UK to, to challenge those sort of supply chain sort of type issues and making sure the right things are in place for people. I mean, how do we how do we keep the profile of this? Up? I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm obviously going to say that because I know that keeping it in the media is important. But actually, when you think about human rights issues, it's and climate change. This is a this is a crowded field. We know companies are engaging on this uh, more and more. They know that they, they know that their shareholders are expecting it. Big companies, but. You know, when conviction rates are low, it's really hard to get a prosecution, even though we've got this uh, legislation. If the waters between immigration, illegal immigration, and modern slavery and human trafficking are muddied so that the public don't really understand what it is, you know, there's a lot against it at the moment, is there, in terms of, in, in terms of getting a clear message and clear picture out? Yes, and I think that's on us. I, I think we've got to do a heck of a lot better if we're running charities like this and we're doing jobs that we're talking about to um, help people understand what's going on. There's this underworld, this parallel universe that's going on out there, sometimes right before our eyes. If we can sit in seats like mine and blame the government or have a pop at police or well, why is that sentence so poor? But unless we create the conditions in this country for, for this to become one of the key issues, and why shouldn't it be? This is the dehumanization of mankind. And it, so why isn't it top of the list? It's because I don't think we're doing a good enough job as a sector, as passionate people, to go out and win the argument. Look at the way things change on issues. It sometimes takes decades, but people are making the argument. They're raising concerns. So when a government tries to take through certain legislation, they only do it on anything because they feel there's public support. So we have got to get to the place where people um, prioritise this. And I think that's about rehumanising what ends up being statistics, boats, um, lorries. It, it, we, we in this work can feel like everything is normal and that this is something we get used to and we become numb to it. But for most people out there, this is jaw-dropping. And this is what you do, Julie, which is excellent. And we've got to do more. We, we, we do what we can at Justice and Care. We've got this amazing new podcast out, which we've done with The Guardian. Have a listen. It starts to get us into this space. But if we're not winning the argument, why do we expect governments to do the right thing, police to prioritise this? It's on us. Yeah, I mean, you did, Justice and Care did some interesting polling on it that people do actually understand now. I mean, but when I used to go to news desks sort of 10, 15 years ago, they'd sort of say, just take me through it again. What is it again? What exactly are you talking about? Does it involve people being actually chained up? No, it doesn't involve people necessarily. Sometimes in the most hideous circumstances it can be. But we're talking about coercion. We're talking about exploitation. We're talking about people who are fundamentally not free, not just because they're being exploited commercially, but because uh, their traffickers have got a coercive control over them. So people are getting it, there's aren't an, they? There's an understanding this happens now, and it does feature more in the debate. But then there is the, the, the nuance, because right now, people if you stop people in the street and say, what's the difference between human trafficking and people smuggling? Mm. Or you stop, to be honest, the average minister in the street. You know, this, um, there's more to do. And I think the public, when you explain it, are desperate for action. And change, I think, is so much closer than we realize at scale. And the other thing I'd say we've got to do is start to prove this is winnable. Because it can feel like you're sort of stood at the foot of Everest and, and you're looking up and thinking it's 50 million people, it's everywhere. When you start, as we're trying to do and others are doing, to show this is beatable, the belief rises, people take action and they get engaged. I don't think we have to lock up every trafficker. I think we have to lock up enough so the rest of them think, not for me. And I think there's a tipping point we've got to achieve. Matt, you want to come in there? Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, in all the years that we've had engaging with companies and you know, supply chains, auditors and departments, I've yet to meet an effective advocate pro-modern slavery when you, when you <laughs> yeah. confront... And, 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 sorry, it's a slightly superficial su su thing to say, but it's if you start to talk to someone about... Um, garment workers kind of in the in, were 10 years since the Rana Plaza building yeah. collapse 
you would legitimately get people saying, well, at least it's a job in these loop and you would get that kind of to and fro. But actually, if you use modern slavery, it cuts out all that white noise and cuts to the chase of the debate about how companies should step up and have a responsibility. I mean, I was thinking just then, you know, it's 10 years since the Rana Plaza building collapse and, you know, what have we achieved in that time? And I think one of the things I want to challenge is this reliance on auditing as the way of solving supply chains and just hearing the, the sort of tone of this discussion about the sense of partnership that we need to get. I think we need to radically rethink like, how we approach power dynamics in supply chains and just, we can't just expect companies to say, we'll make it illegal in our contracts for you to have it because that will just lead a compliance culture and people will just hide it in shadow factories and stuff. And it's a huge, big, amorphous thing to try and deal with, but actually we'd need to try and empower all the different levels of the supply chain to work with each other towards the common goal. And, you know, we've adapted the way we've been talking to companies about that for, to go beyond kind of just tell us how your um, calls to your uh, whistleblowing helpline are going, but how are you partnering with all levels of your supply chain to try and grapple with this issue. That's a lot of work, isn't it? I mean, if you've got a complex supply chain, that is a, that's a big ask, isn't it? I mean, that really fundamentally shifts on its basis how a big company operates in a complex uh, supply chain. Yeah, it does. And, and thankfully, there's some solutions coming out there in terms of you know complex data capturing and some mm. of the new tools we have to be able to... Because if everybody is that transparent, it starts to solve everybody's problem. Yeah. So we've seen a huge growth in things like the supplier eth ethical data exchange and other these kind of multi-user kind of um, supplier um, data frameworks to help you map your supply chain. But we've got a huge amount more to go in terms of that updated radical transparency and then what you do when you find something that doesn't meet your, your code of conduct. I think that's the other thing we haven't addressed. You know, it's very easy to cut and run. Um, the, the example I always find is... Um, <laughs> the Boohoo example that happened just during lockdown, which I'm sure some of you will have um, been aware of. You know, Boohoo had kind of everything you'd want in terms of a, uh, a corporate su um, supply chain department, a modern slavery statement. And, you know, but their response kind of didn't actually partner with the issue and seek to, to solve it. So how do we bring the power of business, you know, to use their influence to actually go looking for this stuff? Because it is there, if we've heard. We know it is. Look, sorry, thank you. We've, we've got to start thinking about people. It's people on the end of all this. And I think that when we talk sometimes about businesses and supply chains, we forget the people. And they're the people. That's what is important. It's, it is about seeing them. And, you know, if you've got somebody in your factory as the, as the supervisor and they're not coming in to work on their own and they're, they're being brought in and they're not talking to anybody and they don't have any lunch and stuff like that it's, it is about seeing people rather than numbers and that goes to the boat issue and everything else we stop, need to stop talking about boats we need to start talking about people who are desperate enough to be in that situation and why are they desperate what's pushing them to that and it, it's about seeing people isn't it and the more we see people the more we can help people and we can stop this I think that's absolutely at the heart of, I know, what drives all of you three with what, what you do. And something that just struck me there, Matt, with what you were saying is that this is an amorphous issue. And you will be aware of this too, Debbie, and I know you certainly are Christian, is that, you know, this, the Modern Slavery Act is quite a big umbrella act, isn't it? In the space of time that I've been reporting on this issue, modern slavery has morphed and you know, you find it appearing in all sorts of different ways that you never would have imagined, and, and cuckooing. I mean, we, let's let's just take that as an example because it's the one that you and I have worked on uh, most closely, and Jamie and the, and the team uh, so brilliantly, uh, Justice and Care, is that it's worth noting that amongst the nationals who are represented in the modern slavery statistics in this country, British nationals are now the second largest largest groups. I mean, um, traditionally, Nigeria, Albania, Romania always feature very highly. But for the first time now, we've got this huge body of British nationals appearing in the statistics. Just give us a sense of why that is and why that's a particular area that, you know, is, is worth being alert to at this point. It's important because listening to the discussion, you'd think it was a borders problem, weak borders or people moving across borders. And of course, that's a huge focus and for, for criminal gangs they do move people but the British Nationals has, has been a, a growing um, 
a growing concern. And that, you know, cuckooing is just an example of where some of this is coming from. Cuckooing, for those of you who don't know, is when a, a criminal gang or a criminal enterprise will take control of, of usually a very vulnerable person's house and use it for, for dealing, for exploitation. And we've had cases of people locked up in their own home through this for over a year, grandmothers even, and um, up in the north. And uh, so it's, it just helps you to tell the story and challenge the assumption this is simply about immigration. And one of the ways we need to get out and make the argument again, which we, we successfully did about five or six years ago or a bit before when Theresa May got the Modern Slavery Act through, who, by the way, was seen back then as a very hardline home secretary, <laughs> hostile environment. She got it. She disentangled immigration from slavery and realized they weren't the same thing. Um, we've got to do that again. And the British Nationals is a, is a way of clearly doing that. Yeah, and that's part of the county, county lines county drugs lines. picture, isn't it? So yeah, we we're seeing a lot that. of young people, a lot of children um, being caught up in this. You will see this from your frontline work, don't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's one of those um, issues that comes to light in policing through antisocial behaviour, um, something that we all see day in, day out. And it's difficult to um, not necessarily understand, but to probably understand is the right word, that why are people put in that situation? So when you look at children, why are they, how does that happen? You know, they should be at school or their parents looking after them or how, how does we, how do we get to that point? But they're looking for community. They're looking for people that care. And I'm not saying that parents don't care and schools don't care because of course they do. But when you relate to somebody because they wear the same trainers or they can get the trainers that you want and let me tell you i've got four boys buying four <laughs> pairs of expensive trainers <laughs> is not happening in my house but you know that's that's the bottom line and that's you know those sometimes those real basic things are why kids get involved in stuff like that or because their mate said i'll oh, just look after this for me mm. well all of a sudden then they're they're caught up in something that they can't control and then, you know, I w cuckooing makes me really sad because I think that we're in a society where we should be looking after people in our community that are vulnerable. And when you look at um, people with mental health issues or with addiction issues, there's all sorts of social care that should be going into that. There's all sorts of adult social care touch points. There's all sorts of um, local authority touch points that are seeing those people day in, day out. And yet there are still hundreds of people in the UK being cuckooed. It, it beggars belief, really. I mean, I have to say the story that, um, and, and again, it was one of those moments where you see why I need all of you guys to be able to get this stuff to air, was that there was one, uh, a grandmother who was being supported by a victim navigator um, up in the northwest, and her home had been cuckooed. She was a vener very vulnerable ex-addict, and the local um, leader of a drugs gang and his sidekick had got into her flat on a summer's night, run in in the rain, um, and brought some of his foot soldiers, as she described them, into to her home. And before she knew it, her little flat had been taken over. She was being made to sleep on the floor um, and made to run drugs for this character. Um, he threatened her with a Stanley blade that if she spoke out, she would lose her tongue. He fed her the crusts from his pizza while she was sitting on the floor alongside him. And this was happening in a modern British city right under the noses of a whole community. And it took a long time and a lot of good police work, but it took a long time for her to get out. And now, thankfully, moved to a safer area with a victim navigator. She is starting to rebuild her life. That is happening in every town and city in this country. Every police force knows cuckooing is part of county lines that they have to, to fight against. But, you know, one of the other difficult things about her journey is in the process of being rescued and supported and being put into a safe, safe place with the navigator involved. The local council decided that she wasn't resident in her flat. They didn't decided not to try and contact her. They took all her property out of her flat and threw it in the bin and closed the doors. So the navigator then advocates on her behalf with the local council and she's actually compensated and as now it's sort of they've been investigated as a result of the what they didn't do and what they should have done she would never have been able to do that on her own and you know the navigator i mean she talks about how bless him he's 
<laughs> saved her life. Yeah. Um, but that just that real practical thing about supporting her to advocate on her behalf with local authorities to just get her own stuff back. Yeah. Just have the confidence in giving her a voice it's back. It's so yeah. important yeah. to have that support. And yeah, amazing work, amazing work. Really incredible. Um, let's have some questions from the floor. I think somebody may have a, a microphone that we can... Oh, look at this. It's so well organised here at the Conduit. Um, if you'd just like to raise your hand and uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name's Annabel Heseltine. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Um, I just wondered if you could put it in the context. We started where we are now, but that's a snapshot. Is, is it getting worse? And I'm presuming that the main countries are the countries you've talked about. But um, is it also all over the world? If there's 50 million slaves across the world, and we're talking about 100,000 in the UK, British Isles, um, where are the main problems and is it getting worse? Thank you very much indeed. Christian, I'm going to sling that one to you. Well, it, it's, the numbers are going up of people identified in the UK, but I think the truth is that they've always been there, but we are learning how to find people now. So it's actually very difficult to say if it's getting worse or not. I think um, the scale of it is, we think we're only finding about one in 10 now um, in, in Britain. Um, but I th you can certainly see criminal gangs adapting. They adjust, they're innovative. So I think it probably is getting worse. The vulnerability is certainly getting worse for people and potential victims and the, the brutality you never never fails to shock me, and I've been doing it for six years. But you, the way you hear about this evolving is, it feels like it's getting worse, but the numbers sometimes just reveal the fact we're finding more of them when they've already been there. Um, globally, there is some good data, um, uh, which, which is called the Global Slavery Index, which is well worth having a look at, to show the way it works within regions. So India and the re region around India is very high, South America to North America. But... Um, it affects every corner of, of, of uh, um, Africa too. Yeah, I was going to say, on that methodology, I think quite a fair chunk of the 50 million is actually forced marriage as well. So it brings in a lot of different categories of vulnerable you know, exploitation. Um, certainly within the European sort of corridor, the, the Ukraine invasion and the instability there, we, we saw kind of anecdotally from the companies that we talked to that instability bringing you know, more into the kind of European companies' orbit. Um, one thing we were able to do, um, this is, again, this that partnership, isn't it, between NGOs and the sort of business community, but people reporting back that they were seeing, you know, criminal gangs operating in the borders of Poland, Moldova, etc. And people come into the UK with their SIM cards, with their phones, and we managed to get one of the big um, network providers here in the UK um, to send a text message to any Ukrainian SIM card coming into the UK, linking people to um, the right kind of support, the right police networks, the right kind of NGO networks and things. So I was quite heartened in that, in the sense that we managed to, in the, in, to the answer to the question, there was certainly an increased risk for us kind of here last year, but some companies really did step up and go beyond what they should, had to do and do something they felt they should do. Yeah, I mean, it was really impressive, wasn't it? And I, and I had a conversation with some of your Romanian colleagues at the time, because as soon as you get that moment of people on the move, I mean, heaven knows we'll be seeing it uh, with what's happening in Sudan at the moment, but you've immediately got a massive moment of vulnerability. And it was really impressive what happened on the um, Ukrainian borders um, after the invasion last year. A lot of NGOs were in the space. The governments understood w the vulnerabilities of those people on the move. So, yes, there are more people who are potential victims, and yet, and there are, you know, the, the more upheaval, the more war, climate change in particular, with, with climate refugees on the move, huge amounts of people on the move, destitute, absolute prime pickings for um, uh, slave masters and, uh, the, and traffickers. But it, what was really heartening last year in, the, in, the, in all of the horror of what happened with Ukraine was that it was an incredible effort on the border, which actually was very heartening to see. And just talking to your guys in Romania, they were saying, actually, we, we feel as though we've been pretty robust with this. I mean, how it plays out over a much longer period once people have settled around Europe, heaven knows it may be a long time before they can return, then you are always going to have pockets of vulnerability. But I think the initial response was pretty robust. So there are things to be positive about, I think. Yeah, next question. Uh, hello, it's Tur Turbin Roberts, a supporter of uh, Justice and Care, who isn't. But Matt, I've got a question for you. The Economist has 
uh, very keen on seeing the breakup of ESG. And I know Rathbone is in the financial world are absolutely at the forefront and doing well in it. But it's a good question because when you broaden it too widely, and indeed 50 million is a huge figure, it's almost too big a figure, uh, what's your view about breaking up ESG into social governance, effectively covering um, the modern slavery issue more specifically? Yeah, very interesting question. So if, if anyone's interested, there's a, there's a really interesting Economist article which essentially advocates that just to focus almost quite narrowly on emissions is the big defining challenge of our time. Um, I obviously would say the most important thing, actually, that I would say is that we need to redress the lack of focus that's gone on governance. The simple fact of people kind of having the right incentives to do the right kind of thing. So if, it, if there was a breakup of ESG because we'd so successfully integrated broader thinking about all kinds of non-financial things into the, the life of an investment bank, the life of a FTSE 350 firm, then I'd be all for it. I think it's a movement that exists to see itself go extinct. What we want to do is bring climate thinking, bring social justice thinking into the economic model as it was always intended to be. Um, yeah, so it's a really interesting issue, but I, I would say, yeah, great. I, I remember even just this year, um, my chief investment officer wanting to get involved more in the responsible investment agenda and me thinking absolutely fantastic 15 years ago that wouldn't have happened and now i've got a, a chief investment officer who wants to do their esg certifications and wants to bring it in because they recognize the value that it adds to the process so yeah a bit of an in-house thing about esg there um but just as a secondary point we can't solve climate change unless we solve this stuff unless we solve vulnerability in supply chains, unless we address the human rights risks. It's wrapped up in this concept called the just transition. Unless we reinvest back in the communities that are affected by the loss of fossil fuel jobs, unless we address the supply chain for all the minerals that go into our electric cars, those kind of things, that's the next big wave that we're going to be engaging on next year. So, yeah, I've said it before, I think it's everything everywhere all at once, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting, Matt. Thank you. Another question there from the lady. Um, hi, thank you very much. Um, such an interesting conversation. Um, my name is Pamela. Um, my question refers to raising awareness and educating the younger generation. Um, Hope for Justice has an educational information pack for schools um, on modern slavery. And my question is, can this information on modern slavery be included as a permanent part of the secondary school curriculum where it can be delivered in context with historic enslavement across curriculums such as history, English, and PSHRE? It's a really great question. Um, who'd like to take that one, Christian? You, I mean, no, a, you do a lot of amazing work in getting good material out there and good information out there. Yes, I think it's an excellent um, question about, about the education system. So we could pick it up with the Department for Education. We've got a policy team working in Westminster. Um, be good to see if they've had that conversation before, but I like, I like it. I think the... The um, ability now as well to use technology, um, I was talking to someone just now about the, the risk of things like TikTok influencing young people's strategies when it comes to mental health and that sometimes they're listening to people who actually are not true experts. I think there's a chance for us to get on the territory and actually raise awareness in a proper way. So um, I like, like the thought, yeah. And, it, and, and actually for it to sit alongside um, a greater breadth of education around issues of slavery historically, I think there is an obvious fit that could be extended and, and, and supported in schools. I mean, I've got a family full of teachers and I try to get them engaged with it. But again, it is a matter of policy. And I suppose actually even, you know, community policing work is vital in this, isn't it? I mean, I know that, you know, certainly when we go back to the county lines, uh, gangs and cuckooing, all of those sort of things, when you've got good community policing that engages with schools, yeah, it's, it's a perfect sort of point of contact, isn't definitely. it? Definitely. And, and I would say even take, take it younger, I think there's a space in primary schools because we are seeing nine, ten-year-olds involved in county lines. Mm. Well, it's too late if you wait until they're 11, 12 and 13. You, you've, you've missed the boat. So it's like a lot of things. If we start younger then you've got, you've got more time to, to help understanding. And, and you, I think as well it's taking parents on that journey because, because you know, like I'll go back to my own kids. Their life is very different than mine was. Um, they're exposed to things that I wasn't. And so I think that it's incumbent on professionals that work with young people to relate to what they're experiencing um, and... 
I think, as you say, community policing is a really good example of things that people, the, you know, the officers see on the streets. And I know community police officers do a lot of work in, in schools. But there is still this juxtaposition about sort of what's OK to talk to children about, isn't yeah. there? And, and that's, that's the issue. Um, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in putting it out there raw cause, because that's the only way you're going to learn. Yeah. Just one more, one more point, which I think the, the sector the charity sector is waking up to, um, the way survivors um, are sometimes, when the time is right, wanting to lead, shape. I mean, we, in Bangladesh, um, funded through the Home Office in the UK, we've just brought 20 of our reintegrated survivors, young women, onto team who are then back into communities, raising awareness, preventing trafficking, helping with aftercare. And so survivor leadership and voice there's lots of people trying lots of it, and it's incredibly important to do it well and ethically, but I think it could be a game changer on this becoming um, a priority in many more places. Yeah, and I also think that sort of ethically survivors' voices, I mean, so much has shifted, hasn't it, in the last 10 years or so, that a lot of work in this um, field is actually being led by survivors. At the Human Rights Lab at Nottingham University, which is one of the most brilliant sort of resources of information and research, a lot of that work there is being led by survivors. Um, and I think that's something that I've really had a sense of of a, of a shift really and and in the ideal world you know the next time the conduit has a conversation like this we'll have a survivor here who speaks very directly about their life experiences but that all goes to that really great question on education i think maybe one more question and then um we've got a gentleman at the back there and then there'll be time for a chat after we've uh, wrapped up thank you I'm going to ask a slightly controversial question patrick stevens um lawyer the I think in the room we would all there would be unanimity on the the uh, points that are being made, but at the moment it appears to me that we we face uh, an environment and, and a government that is not distinguishing between migrants and those that are trafficked, and we are hearing talk um, on the national uh, stage regularly about an invasion of people. We've heard only today from um, the Home Secretary about these people having fundamentally different values to us. And we heard from Robert Jenrick today talking about people coming in illegally, um, cannibalizing the values of the British public. How can we, uh, Christian, I respect you when you say it's on us and I, and I accept that and take it on entirely. But how can we compete with that noise? Well, it's it's uh, you, you see this on the fr you have to deal with this on the front line, Debbie, don't you? Christian, do you want to pick up on that? It's incredibly difficult right now, Patrick, um, and it just I think we've just got to be honest about where it's at and the sort of the the, the what we face in in making progress. But keep going. We've got to just keep saying it. We've got to call it out. We've got to, yes, we've got to also work with them behind the scenes. Um, but the survivors we're dealing with and working with, they don't just need an NGO to sort of help them rebuild. They want an NGO to shape the, the discussion. And I also think that, I do think things change fast. So it's, it's difficult right now. It's bleak right now. But... I think it can turn fast and we've got to be calling for that and we've got to be the most optimistic people in the room. We've got to keep engaging and I think um, it, it, it might change quicker than we think, but it's about facts, it's getting the facts out there, challenging people in, in the right way and telling the stories of human beings and humanizing the whole issue. Um, uh, I did, I did, Julie, I mean, it's probably an unfair question, but. Um, a lot of people blame certain elements of, of press for whipping up and, I don't know, it, it, how we, how we um, also just make sure that we're engaging well with journalists and, and trying to occupy that space because that is often sometimes fueling 
public perception too so well i mean i, I speak as a you know i'm 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 from a broadcaster where you know my, my work as an itv news journalist is uh, one where i have a duty to impartiality um, and I report on these issues, um, whatever the backdrop. But um, fundamentally, as Debbie has underlined so effectively, these are human stories. And I try to tell them in the most clear-sighted way possible. Um, on the moments when we can hold people to account, it's my job to hold people to, uh, to account as a journalist. Um, and I've done that against all sorts of different political backdrops in my, my career. Um, but, you know, just keeping, uh, from my perspective, keeping the issue squarely and fairly on the agenda and, and thinking about language every single time we tell the story. So, you know, I might be working with journalists who've not, you know, I might sometimes work with on, the, on the story and it's somebody who hasn't covered the story of the channel crossings, the, the small boat story before. And it's getting the distinction between people smuggling, trafficking, modern stuff, just making sure the language is absolutely accurate and we're not using umbrella terms whereby there can be misunderstandings. So from my perspective and from my job, that's, that's what I try to do, is just to keep clarity around the issue and keep the light on the, on the, on the human story. Um, I think everybody is working at it from different angles. Debbie, I know you will, see, you will see the impact of whichever political backdrop there is. You will see it directly on the ground. Absolutely, and I think there are always challenges, but we don't give up because you've got to keep trying for people. You've got to give that voice to people that don't have it. So you don't give up, you keep going and we'll find another way around. And I think that that's the amazing thing, the, the space that I feel that we're in at the moment is just because one, an organization, a statutory body say, has got remits, doesn't mean we have. We, there's lots of things that we can do and lots of partnerships that we can create and form to make it better, to make that journey easier for people. It's about not giving up. Matt, do you got anything on that? I mean, you, you, yeah. you know, you've, you, you, you're <coughs> talking to investors the whole time, the people that you're dealing with. I was going to say, one of the things we can do is, is get ahead of the debate and um, try and build those coalitions, you know, ahead of it becoming like a political football. So you, we mentioned the 2014 example. One of the easy arguments that politicians who are weaponizing this issue, to put it in those terms, use is that, oh, we can't regulate against this because business will hate it or investors will oppose it. Um, and what we managed to do was, was bring together a coalition of, you know, the NGOs bringing that real world kind of like experience, bringing us the numbers, the stats globally, and then the investors saying that they wanted the businesses to go and look for it because that brought more stability into their operations. And the businesses saying they wanted a level playing field because they didn't want to be undercut by people with lower wage, uh, labor standards, etc. And we're trying to build that coalition back up again now in anticipation of hopefully brighter days ahead in some way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's to the point of not giving up and, and just keep banging on about the same important stuff because it's no less important than it was. And I'm really pleased to say that we're, we're in really good shape in that regard. There's, all the NGOs are pulling together, which is an exemplar actually to the NGO movement in the, in the country really. The modern slavery NGOs in this country are real credit to themselves, the way in which they pull together their voice on policy. Uh, and working with the investors, we've got, my colleague Archer would give me the exact numbers, but we've got kind of about 20 odd investors now supporting a statement of policy. Things like import bans, export controls, bringing the Modern Slavery Act into public bodies, etc., and bringing the, the British industry kind of executives and lobbying into that as well. So, yeah, um, a very difficult environment, but one that we have to keep working on because, you know, another word for... Um, human rights risk in supply chains is, is a vulnerable supply chain that's going to lose your value over the long term if you think of it purely in those terms. So, yeah, partnership, building that coalition before you need it would be my core messages. Okay, thank you very much. A really great question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm always in my job. I've either got somebody counting down in my ear or I'm juggling a watch on my lap or whatever. Um, but I just um, thank you. They were all really, really... Um, Excellent questions and very thought-provoking. I've already got a bit of my brain whirring away on, 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 on all of them. Um, so I just think it would be nice to just wrap up with a closing thought from each of you who've contributed so 
brilliantly to this discussion. I mean, let's note that where are we at now? We're in April. We could have a general election in 12 to 18 months' time. In terms of getting this on the agenda, in terms of broadening the conversation on this, you know, that, you know, the, the, the time could be ripe. Um, what would your call to arms be to whoever's in the room with a particular skill set um, before everybody goes away and talks about it and has a bit of a networking moment? What would you say? The battery's gone. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, <laughs> the, the one thing I've seen cut through lately is that, I'm not saying it, we've won the argument, but if you want to smash the criminal gangs and disrupt the business model of human trafficking, you've got to put its victims first. You've got to help them recover. They often talk. They go after justice. And so if I had 20 minutes with the Home Secretary, I'd be saying, flip this around. Your victim care isn't some great pull factor that people use as a loophole in the main. It's your secret weapon to smashing the people you really want to go after. And I can agree with her that we've got to take them down. So that's what I would be arguing for. And I think navigators are not a bad way of going about it, by, <laughs> by the way. absolutely brilliant way of going about it. Um, Debbie, what would you say? And, and just for everybody, you know, I mean, everybody's listened so attentively and we've had some really great questions. What do you want to send people away with to fire them up? <laughs> I think, um, for me, it's to help, help me, help my team do our job. And that is, in your day-to-day -day life, don't just go, that was odd. Let's report stuff. Let's do something. Let's have the, the, my call to arms is, this is something that we can all do. We can all make a difference. Yes, it's great that you've got specialists like my team that will support um, those victims once they're identified and work with the police. And it does work. We get convictions. Nine out of 10 victims remain engaged with the criminal justice process if they've got a navigator. That is amazing. So please help us. Report stuff that you see. Help. Thank you. And in terms of how, <laughs> uh, sorry, there is, um, there is a modern slavery helpline that you can call. Um, it's uh, run by Unseen UK. If you Google um, modern slavery helpline, it's a free phone number. So that it's something you can call to report suspicions. It's also something that victims can call free of charge and access. Um, again, University of Nottingham Human Rights Lab, they did some research. On average, for somebody to get rescued, I think it's on average they have to interact with the law enforcement community or somebody from the NGO community on average eight times to get lifted. Um, so we all need our eyes open and we need to report every suspicion. Um, the other thing I, I would always say on this is, when I've talked about numbers and investments, and you're thinking that's not kind of my world, but presumably all of you have got insurance of some description. <laughs> or a pension fund. Actually, we all influence the economic life of the country that we live in. And don't underestimate the power you can have if you have a conversation with whoever you, you bank with, or you might have your pension with, and say, are you thinking about slavery and supply chains and what are you doing about it? And you can look at their modern slavery statement usually and ask them a question. Actually, there is a, a tyranny of the minority sometimes <laughs> in terms of people who actually stick their neck up and ask. So I would just encourage, it's such a difficult issue, isn't it, to go from, I knew nothing about it, to, oh my goodness, 50 million people. <laughs> and how do you stop somewhere in the middle and make sure you're absolutely contributing? So, yeah, try and do what you can with your own kind of financial world, but also use the modern slavery helpline would be my two things. Great, really practical and inspirational uh, stuff, all three. Thank you so much for your time and your insight into this really complex but really, really pressing issue that faces all of us in every community that we live in. Um, so thank you to thank all you. of you. Um, it's, a, it's been a, a real pleasure to be part of the conversation. Um, thank you again to The Conduit. Um, thank you to Justice and Care, um, whose work is just exemplary, as you've heard already this evening. I know I need to mention a few things, otherwise Ella will tell me off. Um, there's a lot, if you would like to donate uh, to Justice and Care's work, there is uh, information all around around this room, including QR codes. I mean, they've got it covered. Every, every <laughs> angle, they will, they, they've got a way. Um, especially having heard this inspirational um, information about their victim navigator work, uh, they will be there with information on how you might be able to support it if you
if you'd like to understand better how it works, uh, the Justice and Care team are all here. Um, so whichever way you'd like to further your interest and engagement on this really important issue, it would be absolutely wonderful. Um, enjoy meeting and spending more time with one another and chatting to, to the guys here. I know we'll be hanging on, but thank you very much for your kind attention and thank you again to The Conduit. Thank you.